Welcome to the Start Me Up podcast, part of the Sexy Liberal Podcast Network. I'm Kimberly, fully vaccinated Johnson in D.C. So excited. Today, my returning guest is Mary Trump. Her latest book, The Reckoning, Our Nation's Trauma and Finding a Way to Heal, is absolutely amazing. You should read it. Do you have it? You should go get it. She's the best Trump. I can't wait to talk to her, but before I do, I always try to keep these intros short. I do have a tier on Patreon that allows listeners to listen ad-free and with a much shorter intro. The Start Me Up podcast is an independent podcast supported by listeners and it's woman run. It's patrons who keep the show going. If you enjoy today's conversation, take a look at the about page. Check out some of my past guests. You'll see most of the time I talk to political people, but occasionally I interview actors because I used to be one. Just visit patreon.com dot com slash start me up. I do two free shows a week, Mondays and Wednesdays, and they're followed up by What's Up with Me, a show for patrons only after each free show. Check out the variety of tier options at patreon.com slash start me up. You can make a one-time donation by checking out the text in the Patreon description. I've included a link that allows you to donate through PayPal. You can find Start Me Up on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. Just stop by the iTunes slash Apple Podcast Store, become a subscriber, it's free, and while you're there, please rate the show and leave me a review. I would really appreciate it. Now, please enjoy my conversation with Mary Trump. Welcome back to the show, Mary. Hey, Kimberly. How's it going? <laughs> well, it's, I'm freaked out. <laughs> 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 and we're going to talk about that. But uh, I think there are reasons to be hopeful and all that good stuff. Um, but first of all, now, I did not prepare any questions for you. I have so many questions for you. Um, some of them are my questions, and then some I took from Twitter and from my Patreon page. So there might not be some smooth transitions between certain questions just because I'm going to go from one thing to another. But I want to start with um, the fact that Donald Trump is suing you and the New York Times for $100 million. And I don't know what you can and can't say. So I'm just going to let you say whatever you want to say about that, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Yeah, I can't say much, um, uh, but enough is out there, I think, for anybody who's seen um, what he's sued me for <laughs> to draw your own conclusions. Right. <laughs> uh, he's suing me in part because um, I allegedly stole – documents that actually belong to me from my <laughs> lawyer uh and that they were his tax documents which they were not they hmm. were my grandfather's interesting financial papers um which i legally obtained through discovery um hmm. so I, I who knows what his reasons are mm -hmm. uh but there was an amusing twist he actually <laughs> his lawyer actually sent a process server to my home which as i'm represented by counsel makes no sense because <laughs> wow. uh, typically they would send the papers right. to my lawyer's office yeah but the best part about it is the process server had a copy of my first book with him <laughs> that he wanted me to sign which of course i did that is <laughs> effing awesome Oh, my yes. God. That's so funny. I don't know why I said that thing. I say fuck all the time. <laughs> it was fucking awesome. I know. So the guy asked if I could sign the book. I was like, so wait a second. You're serving me with a lawsuit, and you want me to sign the book. Okay, what's your name? I'll sign your book. Oh, my God. That is he so was funny. A, he was very sweet. <laughs> well, you know, I, and one of the questions, which I'm going to get to people who, on Twitter and whatnot who ask questions in a bit. I'm going to cover my questions first. But um, – I just want you to know, many of those questions were like, people are really concerned about your, how you're doing. And while you were writing your book and you weren't really tweeting, I kept getting emails and DMs from people going, Kimberly, have you heard from Mary? What's going on with Mary Trump? Where is she? And people were like generally, genuinely concerned. And there, you know, enough people had DM'd me that I started kind of freaking out. And then I messaged you <laughs> and you were okay. And you're like, I've been writing a book and, and everything. So I just, I want you to know, and I'm sure you already know this, but I mean, lots of people are um, very concerned. We care about you. And so I just, you know, I want you to feel that. <laughs> that's feel the that's love. incredibly <laughs> sweet because, you know, we're, it's hard to know sometimes mm -hmm. because we're all still unbelievably in COVID. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's not as bad, at least in New York as it was last year, but right. the fact that, you know, 2,000 people a day pretty much are still dying and we're still dealing with the psychotic people who mm -hmm. think it's okay to threaten school boards to force children to put their lives at risk. Right. You know? So, um, and yeah, we still need to be worried. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I'm hoping to get my booster shot soon. I hope everybody else gets their vaccines and mm-hmm. boosters. Um, so yeah, I'm so you were still kind of semi in isolation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I don't really feel like I'm out in the world at all. So right. it, it's nice to, to hear that. It makes me feel good. Well, good. And um, what which vaccine did you get? I got Pfizer. Okay. Um, so I'll get Pfizer again. Yeah. I, I guess that's how it works. So. <laughs> yeah. I think they're all good, right? I right. Mean, my, my daughter got Johnson & Johnson, so I'm very I'm very much wanting her to get a booster. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just to be on the safe side. But, uh, you yeah. know, they're all good as yeah. long as you get them. Exactly. Well, I mean, I'm, I know, I got Moderna, so – I'm not. A, I don't have. I'm not immunocompromised, so I don't necessarily need a booster. Uh, I well, they haven't said. The last I heard, it was about eight months. So mm-hmm. for, I, I think it was six months for Pfizer, eight months for Moderna. I'm not sure if if Moderna makes it available. I m- I might go because that takes me into January, which is after Christmas, and that's like seeing family. I mean, all my family yeah. is vaccinated, but still, you know, I know my, mm-hmm. my seven year old niece is going to school, and when you have a school situation. Bob mm-hmm. and I are pretty much secluded from the world, and yeah. we do see people from time to time. But uh, yeah, we're both we're both still practicing safety. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so I want to get into this because I know that I only have a limited amount of time with you, and there's like a million questions. And I was reading your book, which is so good, um, The Reckoning, and the f- one of the first things you talked about was the media's role in Donald's ascension. Well, you talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that first I really made note of is the media's role in Donald's ascension, and then also throughout his pregnancy, uh, pregnancy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's hysterical, <laughs> presidency. Uh, I need to figure out what that <laughs> slip meant. <laughs> you know, really. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, you said that instead of, uh, th- that the media, instead of asking, like in 2020, which Democrats can beat him, they should have been asking why a liar who puts his own self-interest over national security isn't even is even allowed to run, and that they, you know, they f- we all know in '16 they filmed empty podiums, mm-hmm. um, waiting for him when they could have literally filmed rallies with Hillary Clinton or other yep. politicians. Planes um, on the tarmac. Planes was a, on the another tarmac. Another favorite so, episode. Yes, and I, I mean, I think we can all see it, and obviously some media outlets are better than others, but. I just want you kind of to talk about that a little bit more and, and, and how they could do better, how you think they could do better. They could do better in so many ways, but the problem is it seems that the, the media writ large never learned the lessons. Mm-hmm. They continue to preference the horse race over uh, facts, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and they seem not to understand that neutrality doesn't mean – giving both sides equal time Mm -hmm. you need to if you're a reporter or journalist you need to be neutral as to the facts Mm -hmm. but biased towards democracy and you're not biased towards democracy if you think that a nazi saying something sorry not a nazi a fascist saying (laughs) something is is the same as a pro-democracy person saying something Mm -hmm. you know uh it's not okay to let a republican on your or to give a republican airtime if he or she is refusing to say that joe biden is the legitimate Mm -hmm. president for example um and not challenge them when at the same time you're blaming everything on Democrats, you know, I, oh, it, right. it's it's quite incredible that the narrative always seems to be against the Democratic Party mm-hmm. and the Republican Party gets a pass. I mean, we're seeing this mm-hmm. as it's playing out with um, the the debt ceiling, the filibuster, the infrastructure bill. Ninety six percent of Democrats in Congress, in both houses of Congress, are united along the ideological spectrum Mm -hmm. from the most progressive to the most moderate, I guess. I don't know uh, what you call a conservative Democrat these days. Um, Joe Biden is a moderate. Mm -hmm. He's not a flaming liberal, right? Right. United 96 percent. It's two people in the Senate who Mm -hmm. are fucking everything up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, so so. That's a, an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, a hundred percent of the Republican Party is united against helping the American people, against fixing our crumbling in infrastructure and investing in it, 
against democracy, basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, and against uh, protecting the credit of the United States of America, mm -hmm. which would lead to a horrific worldwide economic crisis. So it is quite astonishing that the media just don't get it, and I don't know what to do. It seems like it's in their DNA at this point to be, you know, it's it's almost like they're so afraid of being accused of a liberal bias that they bend over backwards to be anti-democratic. It's yeah. it's quite something and I, I'm not sure what the solution is at this point. Do you think Fox News has to do with anything or do you think that it, that this is just kind of evolved on its own because they are usually accused of being the liberal media and they're trying to prove that they're not well i i think fox news is is is, is a problem uh in general well, I yeah mean, <laughs> i don't understand why fox news is allowed to exist quite honestly yeah. i know there's a first amendment but you can't yell fire mm -hmm. in a movie theater so it seems to me that that's what Fox News does on a nightly basis. They're yeah. getting people killed. It's that simple. That's not melodrama at this point. You know, they're they're telling people not to get vaccinated. They're telling people to take ivermectin. They're telling people um, that it's a, a deep state plot against the uh, domestic terrorists who are flooding school boards. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so. Fox News is absolutely the biggest problem. Um, I think if you take away Fox News, there still would be that issue mm -hmm. uh, in the mainstream media, but it would have much less impact, and there would be room on the left mm -hmm. for, to to yeah. get some airtime. Uh, so I, I'm wondering why that is being allowed to slide i don't is it even an issue among the democrats in congress that fox news is being allowed to spread propaganda right. yeah. and disinformation yeah i don't I, think so no, it's not i mean I, I mean i guess there's just so many pressing problems and that is a huge big one uh yeah. but it does you know i mean it's like there's all these other things they have to do in order to at least protect our democracy you know i, I obviously we need to get these voting bills passed um yep. And I don't know how we're going to do that, but I'm hoping that we can do it. But it's interesting because in, I'm going to read an excerpt from your book. It's just a paragraph. But boy, this just says it all. It says, and, and this, I think it kind of lends itself to what you were just talking about. Okay, so quote, people tend to shy away from language that seems extreme as if it's rude or using it would make them seem melodramatic or unhinged. If we don't call things what they are, if we don't use language honestly, we can't expect people to understand what's really going on. By failing to use language accurately because it would be impolite or we don't want to offend anybody, we set up a situation which describing the Republican Party of fascists leads people to question the extremity of the language rather than the validity of the premise. Oh, my God. That is so – not only does that fit in with what you were just talking about, but just take that down to just individual families all across the country – where mm -hmm. there are issues going on within families, and I'm sure you can understand this very well. <laughs> I'll try. I'll <laughs> see if I can imagine it. I'm pretty imaginative. Yeah, I'll, and I'll... and people don't want to talk about it. And I think that's one of the the problems that we see in mainstream media these days is like people think, oh, that doesn't sound good. It sounds too extreme. Or, And you know what? I mean, you you changed your word from Nazi to fascist, which is understandable. But at the same time, like I remember in 2012, 2013, especially when the Tea Party came into power and we were watching their behavior. And, and, and so I would see voters starting to compare them to Nazis. And on Facebook and other social media platforms, you couldn't say that because you would get kicked off uh, mm -hmm. and, or pages would be shut down. Now it's much more commonplace and you see it everywhere. And clearly they are not Nazis from Germany and right. they're not putting people in ovens. But what they, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different situation, but it's, it's coming from the same ideology, which is white supremacy. And feeling as if white people are uh, superior. And you wrote, now of course I'm skipping over, I had another question first, but you, you wrote in your book so much 
about um, race, and you said, uh, y you described the myth of white supremacy. So I just want you to talk about what the myth of white supremacy is. Well, it's, it's basically um, what it sounds like, that the idea that there is such a thing, first of all, as race, mm -hmm. you know, ra there's no biological distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no biological basis for dividing people into different races. Race is a social construct, mm -hmm. and it was constructed to advantage one skin color over another. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that somebody with white skin is superior to somebody with brown skin or black skin is absurd mm -hmm. because genetically we're all the same so uh our intelligence our um emotional whether it's emotional intelligence or uh academic whatever it is mm -hmm. it's the the product of um our genetic makeup our um the families in which we're raised, the, the social situations in which we're raised, our education, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if there's a level playing field, mm -hmm. which, of course, in this country there is not, right. then it's completely arbitrary. But because of the uh, dire circumstances in which this country was started, <laughs> white people knew they needed to come up with a rationale for enslaving an entire other race of people and committing genocide against another in order to protect themselves from the, the cruelty and barbarity of their actions mm -hmm. and to make sure that they never had to suffer any consequences for them. Um, so whiteness and white superiority was made to be considered more important than um, alliance across uh, economic groups, for example. In fact, and this is the same is true now, but quote unquote white laborers and quote unquote black laborers have more in common and have more to gain from banding together and mm -hmm. creating an alliance than rich whites and poor whites do. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you, you make people believe that white privilege is an actual thing that can benefit them mm -hmm. in ways uh, that are better than you know economic equality, which is kind of the trick that, that's been pulled off mm -hmm. over the last few centuries, then you can basically get people to do anything. Yeah, and also I think, it, uh, again, it lends itself to what you're saying because uh, in that quote, where if it's pl if something is played down, if it doesn't sound good, if mm -hmm. we can make it sound better, or make it sound, people will, will buy into it. And uh, it, I just thought it was fascinating that you cover, a l you write a lot about racism in your book and how, um, like for instance, in the Civil War, the Northerners, they didn't believe that people should be enslaved, but they did not consider black people as equal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, or, or I would like for you to kind of, explain because you like I said you did pay a lot of attention to racism in America starting from the beginning and like how does that relate to Donald and his administration it's something that because it's never been confronted it's a problem that's never been fixed mm -hmm. or resolved in yeah. any way so because of that because in the aftermath of the Civil War, the side that actually won didn't do enough or really anything yeah. to um, institutionalize the reasons for which the war was fought, didn't do anything to punish the side of that was traitors, mm -hmm. that was the slaveholders. Yeah. Um, it allowed the losing side to win the narrative, which is something that Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative says quite clearly. Um, so Reconstruction, a 
although it made great strides in the 12 years after the Civil War, ultimately failed spectacularly because there wasn't the political will in the North to do the hard work, and it became easier to make common cause with uh, the Confederacy, mm-hmm. you know, which still existed, yeah. than it did to make common cause with the people who had been enslaved for 400 years and to whom this country owed an enormous incalculable debt. Mm-hmm. So the backsliding was incredible. And it's almost as if, like, so, and so the fallout from that is that, you know, the North has an enormous amount of responsibility as well. Mm-hmm. And as, one thing we've learned from Donald is that apparently a lot of adult human beings don't like to take responsibility for their <laughs> actions and they don't like to admit when they're wrong. Yes. So now we have a generation of Americans that really thinks that the Civil War solved everything mm-hmm. as if the hundred years of Jim Crow just never happened. Yeah. And it's a totally equal playing field and black Americans have nothing to complain about. It is quite an extraordinary sleight of hand. And if we are going to accomplish anything, that needs to be dealt with. We need to understand that the the traumas that white people inflicted upon the native population upon and the uh, kidnapped Africans mm-hmm. were not only never atoned for, they've barely been acknowledged. Mm-hmm. We need to acknowledge them now. We need to look in the mirror and start being the adults in the room who actually do take responsibility for their actions. So the next question, uh, you talked about uh, Obama. And the fact that uh, you thought he was wrong not to hold Bush and his administration responsible for the acts of terror, um, that it would be seen as retaliatory. retaliatory. Uh, Hopefully I just said that right. Anyway, um, and it makes it all that more difficult to hold Donald accountable. So I'm wondering what, you know, I mean, if you're looking on social media, you're seeing a lot of people saying, Merrick Garland, where the fuck are you? (laughs) And you also mentioned that uh, early in Donald's presidency, that the le- that Democratic leaders had a history of misreading the character of the GOP, and uh, that be- basically the, the long and short is, okay, if we're not going to address what happened with enslavement and how, how white people have treated people of color over the years, if we don't hold your uncle, Donald, and his administration responsible, then basically we're just going to keep seeing this happen over and over again what do you think is going on with Merrick Garland just I know you're not in the office (laughs) but are you confident are you concerned what do you see going on I'm very concerned that doesn't mean that nothing's happening behind the scenes but if something is happening behind the scenes, it is the tightest run DOJ in the history of (laughs) DOJs Um, and he's done enough He's made enough uh, wrong moves for me to be worried. Mm -hmm. Uh, The fact that he's taken up Donald's side against E. Jean Carroll and her defamation suit against him is unspeakable, Yeah, quite honestly. Um, So I'm afraid that that Merrick Garland is an institutionalist Mm -hmm. who can't get out of his own way. Um, He should not have had this job – it seemed like a consolation prize. Yes. And the fact of the matter, it, one of the, in my view, worst things that Barack Obama did was nominate Merrick Garland. Hmm. Uh, it, it was another instance of Democrats trying to appease the right, mm-hmm. and we still ended up with nothing. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but because he made the quite um, weak move of nominating a middle-aged white guy, nobody cared. Or not nobody cared. That's a good point. He didn't... Nobody was, like, motivated to get out in the streets. Mm -hmm. If he had, you know, nominated a 40-year-old black woman, it would have been a totally different story because it would have made what Mitch McConnell did look even worse. Yes, that's such a good point. Yes. Um, So... Uh, Merrick Garden shouldn't be AG. He shouldn't have been nominated. And this again, though, is just what happens when generation after generation after generation, white, powerful, powerful white men get away with whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this started with Robert E. Lee. Not only did Robert E. Lee get away with it and have a career as a university president, he was pardoned by Gerald Ford, the greatest traitor wow. to this country. 
who enslaved and tortured other human beings, mm-hmm. who was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, and who was a traitor to this country, was pardoned by an American president in the late 20th century. Think about the message that sends. Mm-hmm. And it's, as a journalist I spoke to a couple of months ago, I wish I could remember who it was, but he said, Donald is a man who is 250 years in the making. Mm-hmm. He's, he's 250 years worth of, again, lack of accountability, getting away with things with impunity, and the degradation of expertise and the um, preferencing of, of ignorance, really, yeah. and failing to deal with white supremacy. There And there's Donald. I mean, he is literally the um, absurd conclusion of this decades-long Republican project to keep people uneducated, mm-hmm. un- disconnected from government, and suspicious of yeah. their elected officials. Wow. Yeah, 100%. Um, you said also, God, th- this line here just stood out to me. You said, while it's true we snatched democracy from the jaws of autocracy, there is still a gun pointed at democracy's head. And then you also wrote that de- the democratic, that a democratic process like an election cannot fix the problems of a democracy. If that, pro- if that process is deliberately hamstrung by a major political party that wants to do away with democracy in order to hang on to power in the face of a changing electorate whose interests are, or I'm sorry, whose interests the party only occasionally represents. Now, the reason I'm bringing these up is because I think, you know, a lot of us understand how important these fresh voting bills are that the GOP doesn't want to even deal with and that Joe <laughs> Manchin and Kristen Cinema don't want to deal with the uh, filibuster. So I wanted to ask you your opinion on this. Like, aside from these bills, um, how do we remedy what you were just talking about with a gun pointed at democracy's head with this, um, like, insurrectionist party – how can we effectively deal with them? E- okay, so I think obviously if we pass these bills, I think there's a much more clear path to that, to, to, to fixing it. But I don't know. I want to hear what you have to say because it's, cause basically what I'm hearing is that's w- we need more than that. So how do we get there? Well, nothing, nothing happens if the Democratic Party uh, doesn't get on board with – understanding the threat yeah we face um joe biden needs to expand the size of the supreme court he needs to double the size of the federal judiciary and he needs to do whatever he needs to do in order to get cinema and mansion mm-hmm. on board whether it's making cinema queen of arizona and mansion king <laughs> of west i don't know but i mean pay them off they're getting paid off exactly, anyway so- yes Pay them have, more. Let's, let's have the good guys pay them off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and just just say, okay, fine. Here's $100 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, save democracy. Yeah. But short of that, um, I don't know. It's, it's sort of like climate change. Sure, if I turn the lights off every time I leave the room <laughs> and I recycle, uh, right. that's great. But it's if, if large corporations and, um, you know, the – most powerful countries on the planet don't start doing something what i do is irrelevant yeah true that having been said uh, democrats need to get much better at focusing on local elections Mm -hmm. and making the supreme court um the most important (laughs) (laughs) uh thing to vote on Mm -hmm. because everything is uh, impacted by Mm the supreme court from climate change to voting rights to women's rights to LGBTQ yeah. rights, on and on and on. So um, that's that's just a sort of a um, cultural shift that has to happen. Right. We need people on school boards as we're seeing how important that is. Mm-hmm. We're seeing how important it is to control legis- state legislatures. We're seeing how important it is to have uh, sane people – who believe in the democratic process and attorney generals at the state level and, and governors, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, So that's what I would say. But again, um, it's a much harder road to hoe if, if the Democrats in Congress 
aren't doing everything in their power yeah. um, because I mean, this has been the case for a long time that Democrats always have to outperform just to break even. Mm -hmm. That's going to become even more the case. Um, you know, I don't I don't remember precisely what the numbers were, but let's say this. I think it was Ohio, but Democrats got something like 65 percent of the vote and ended up with 50 percent of the legislative seats. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Because of gerrymandering, voter suppression, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so Stacey Abrams. Uh, pulled off a miracle in mm -hmm. Georgia, but if the Republicans keep uh, doing what they're doing, um, I don't know if it's going to be possible going forward yeah. to Demo for Democrats to win it all in certain states. Yeah. And that's all that the Republicans need. They just need, just need to yeah. uh, tilt the, the – to rig the system in their favor even a little bit more mm -hmm. so that Democrats cannot win statewide right. in Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, for right. example. right. You know, I just I have to say, um, I heard on MSNBC, and I don't know who it was, but it was one of the you know Chris Hayes or or Joey Reid talking about the importance. Hard to tell them apart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, how the Republicans are very organized when it comes to messaging, <laughs> specifically about the Supreme Court, and that they <laughs> get people to vo to vote on that alone. How that could be like a single issue voter. Or, or, you know, that could be a single issue for a voter. Now, mm -hmm. I've always said, I wrote this in my book, American Woman, because I wrote this book, American Woman, the pole dance, women in voting, for my younger self, who was not mm -hmm. paying attention. And, you know, I, you know, I was young in Los Angeles. I was wanted to be an actor. My mother was always political, but I just didn't have any interest in it. I did start, I will say at least I started voting early. Bill Clinton was the first person that I voted for. And I would usually ask my mother her opinion because I trusted her and she's obviously very liberal, but um, I just didn't care. And if I would have understood at, at, at a young age how important the Supreme Court was, I know I would have been more politically engaged. I may not have been to the point obsessed where I am now because part of the reason I'm obsessed is because of what's happening with Republicans and the way that mm -hmm. they're you know, taking our rights away and everything. But, I mean, when things were a little bit more comfortable, if I would have just understood it, and I think Democrats could really help themselves out by promoting, like, I, I think that Joe Biden should do, whether it's weekly or biweekly or at least once a month, like a fireside chat kind of a thing, where he talks directly to us, not to reporters, not in this official capacity, but just relaxed in a chair, and, you know, it can be pre-recorded, and he can address certain, you know, here's what the Democrats are doing, here's what the Republicans are doing, here's what the Democrats want to do, and here's what the Republicans want to do, and just spell it out. And I think that, you know, if, and, and I've had, you know, I mentioned this on Twitter, and people will argue with me, and they'll tell me why it's never going to work, but I feel like if, if he did that, it would be picked up on local stations the more he talks about certain issues, and not only focusing on the cost of a bill, but what's in the bill and how it's going mm -hmm. to improve your life. I think if you know, it's going to reach some of these families who are just too busy to obsessively pay attention to Twitter, political Twitter and MSNBC and all of that. And you know, maybe they only catch a little bit on the evening news. And so I think you know, if he were to do that on a regular basis, I think there are things Democrats could do that would help inform the public better. And because there's this huge untapped population of non-voters and i think that if they just said oh just like me you know it's like i would have yeah. easily but but so anyway that was just something i had to throw out there um well but, i want to just pick up on that because i agree with you the problem is that it's necessary mm -hmm. and this is something i should have said earlier you know what can we do well we've got short-term things uh that we need to do, but then we have long-term projects. And one yeah. of those is we need to start teaching civics again. Yes, um, yes. We need to teach critical thinking. We need to teach media, media literacy. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But when I say teach civics, I don't mean, you know, give juniors in high school a semester on the government. Right. I mean, start in elementary school. Yes. And throughout a child's 12 years of education, of primary education, teach them why it matters to their lives why yes. on a day-to-day -day basis do they need to understand mm -hmm. how congress works how what the supreme court does what 
it means to vote, what it means when this when legislation passes, et cetera. Um, because that's the problem. People are so disconnected mm -hmm. that they look at what's going on now and they think whatever happens, it's Biden's fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, obviously the media don't help. No, <laughs> they're they do not. They're, cause they're saying <laughs> the same thing. But if you understand how these things work, you know that, that it's not that simple. Yeah. And that it isn't enough for the Democrats to want our country to get democracy if, you know, the Republicans are using power in a way that is corrupt and, by the way, perfectly allowed within the system as, mm -hmm. it's cur as it currently exists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, it's just about understanding government. That, that would have made all the difference. And, and you are fighting an uphill battle when you're dealing with kids because, you know, they're more concerned about fashion and what the boy thinks and what the girl thinks and what their friends think. And obviously those are pressing for them. But if, but if it's forced, if it's in school and they have to get good grades, you know, it, it's something that at least some of it will take. And every once in a while, something's going to come out the teacher or a book or whatever it is is going to teach that kid oh it's going to be that light bulb moment just like with me in the supreme court i i just mm -hmm. you know of course i didn't come to this until later in life but i i, I recognized oh my god if somebody would have just told me that and you know i mean again my mother is very smart she i mean she was a straight a student in school i she, there was this one time as an adult she was in college it was community college but she had a 4.0 grade point average and she was I think she was interested at that point in looking into law school, which I think she was accepted but changed her mind, didn't want it. But she was working full time at a car dealership in finance and getting, you know, straight A's in college. So, um, you know, she mm -hmm. understood what was going on. And she yep. had a daughter who just <laughs> was like, I'm like Los Angeles acting and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cute guy that I see at the bar, whatever, that's what had my attention. And mm -hmm. she couldn't make me interested. And so I think, you know, it, it's like you're saying, if you get them early and you, all it takes is that one little idea to spark in somebody's mind and for them to go, oh, and put it together. And it's so important. Um, I, yeah. wish, I wish that we would see, I wish, like you said, civics needs to go back. And I, there's so many, I have so many ideas that I, I think would be, successful but i don't have the right ear so <laughs> you yeah know, one, well, of does, find, right? uh, one of these the days i'll find one of these days i'll find that ear okay so i'm going to ask you some questions now from from people on twitter and people from my patreon page so what's let's start with patreon okay somebody from my page says what does mary think her father would say about donald and his seditious antics regarding the 2020 election and would he have been public about it that is such a hard question to answer I'm sure. because honestly it's when I was 16 when he died. Mm -hmm. So there's that, uh, but it's very difficult for me to imagine my father healthy uh, you know? right. yeah. uh, because he was an alcoholic the entire time I knew him mm -hmm. and um, a quite broken person. Mm. So I would have to imagine him healthy right. <laughs> before I can answer that question. And it's very hard. Do my dad knew exactly who Donald was, mm -hmm. and I think if we could take out the um, the cruelty he suffered from and take out the family politics and all that, uh, yeah, he he wouldn't be surprised right. at all. And I'd like to think he would speak out. Mm -hmm. I really would, but um, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. He was. I believe he was a good, decent person. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more likely than not. Um, you know, I mean, I guess I could say whatever I wanted to. But <laughs> I, just, I, I really do. I really would like to think that if he ever had been allowed to escape uh, from the family, yeah, that he would have uh, ended up on the right side of things. Right. Um, okay, so let's see. What evil... Does Mary think <laughs> <laughs> that Ivanka and Jared are up to? They're off the radar. <laughs> oh God! Just the fact that they exist. Uh, I know. Again, with no consequences for anything. Yes. Um. Well, like, what are they doing? I, you know, now? we're hearing about their involvement with Facebook. Yeah. 
and giving the execrable Mark Zuckerman cover mm -hmm. uh, in exchange for essentially helping Donald try to steal another election. Yeah. Um, there's nothing they're not capable of. However, right. I think part of me thinks that what they're doing is they're making the calculation if they, they lay low long enough and they stay quiet long enough that they can reemerge into mm -hmm. New York high society as if nothing ever happened. Um, we need to make sure that never happens. Right. Yes, <laughs> so, we do. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's that's partially what they're focused on. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whatever grift. I'd also like to think, though, that they are um, desperately trying to figure out how to defend themselves against charges that might be coming <laughs> their way. Here's hoping. Well, and, and that leads me to my own question, which is, and you've said you thought Ivanka would throw him under the bus, throw Donald under the bus. So mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, wanting you to talk about that a little more because it's just so nice to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> like roll around in it. Right. Well, what's interesting, too, is that Donald would throw his children under the bus as well. Yes. But he's the big fish. Yeah. So he may not understand that prosecutors don't. Ask, don't don't give the big fish immunity <laughs> to, to go after little fish. It's the other way around. Right. And let's be clear here. Uh, it we don't know if Donald has any money at all. Mm -hmm. um, I can't believe I didn't realize he had been still on the Forbes list. He never should have been. <laughs> right. It was never his money. But okay. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is, Ivanka's money is from Jared's legitimately very wealthy family. Yes. Um, and that's from, you know, all sorts of favors that were done because they had leverage as people running the American government for four years. So just from an economic, economic standpoint, it would be foolish for her to um, put herself at risk to protect Donald. And right, why, yeah. again, why would she? Yeah. You know, it's so transactional. As soon as she realizes he can't do anything for her anymore, mm -hmm. there's no reason at all yeah. for her to uh, stand in the way of any <laughs> prosecution. She she is so offensive. I mean, I mm -hmm. think I think Melania is offensive, but I think out of all of them, um, you know, Donald and Ivanka are to me the most offensive. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're just so awful. Um, but I know you agree. Why choose? <laughs> I know, why choose? They're all awful. Yep. Um, okay, so here's an obvious one, but I don't know. Maybe you'll surprise us with something. Somebody wanted to know, what is the one thing keeping you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> or is there all, how many things? <laughs> Wait, I can only pick one. Wow. What's keeping me up laugh, at night is yeah. that I can't keep track of all the things that are keeping me up at night <laughs> because there are so many things yeah. to be terrified by. Um, you know, I, I think it's um, – I, I'm just, I'm having a really hard time dealing with the gratuitous cruelty of people, mm -hmm. um, which is why I, I need to turn off mm -hmm. the news, or I don't watch the news, but uh, Twitter or whatever <laughs> once in a while, and I'm just, the most recent example I'm thinking of the, there was a, a, a black family who moved into a neighborhood, <laughs> and their white neighbors uh, set up this system where um, these motion detectors, so whenever these people left the house or came back home, it would trigger a recording um, of the most virulent racial slurs. Yeah. And I, I just, I you know, know, why? Why? Know. Like, what? You have so little going on. Exactly. You, and, you and... are so bereft of humanity that that's what you think is worth your while. Yeah, and I mean, I, I feel like, and the, and the police are saying there's nothing we can do, but I'm wondering <sighs> if the situation were reversed and it was a white family and uh, black people were doing this to them, if the police would say, well, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, they'd find a way. Yeah, they'd find a way. It's harassment at it the is. very least, so yeah. I, I don't know. It's, but it's just, it's just, it's hard to, it's hard to bear mm -hmm. um, the cruelty of people. And yeah, it really is. considering how much we're all suffering anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's mind-blowing how mm -hmm. people can, I, I just don't even understand how someone can treat someone so horribly and, and think, I don't know, feel, feel anything good about it or 
feel satisfied. I mean, good is maybe not the right word, but satisfied certainly they feel. St- yeah, and superior, undoubtedly. Superior, yeah. And it's just, you know, there are all sorts of examples. Sometimes it's not it's not that kind of explicit mm-hmm. cruelty, but just people who, you know, organize mask burnings with mm-hmm. their children. Do you, are you seriously so empty? <laughs> is that the most important thing you can think of doing? Mm-hmm. Besides the fact that it's it's stupid and it's counterproductive yes. and it's dangerous to teach your children these things, mm-hmm. but just like, like imagine like thinking that the best way for you to spend your day is to go down to a school board meeting and threaten them because yeah. they want to quarantine children who've been exposed to COVID. Right. Yeah. It's, it's mind blowing. It is mind blowing. Um, okay. And so, since I asked you what's keeping you up at night, somebody said I want to know what she's doing to have fun these days, what TV shows is she watching, for example? Wow, fun. Can you define that? <laughs> I know. I know. What's that? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, let's see. God, this is so horrible. I don't know. <laughs> Are you, do, do you watch okay, shows? Okay, so let's just, you know, let's keep it really simple. What okay. TV am I? I'm really loving uh, Only Murders in the Building. <laughs> I am. And um, The Morning Show. Yes, that's so great. Uh, I'm a little disappointed by Foundation, but I'm hanging in <laughs> there. Um, are you watching Are you watching I'm, Ted Lasso? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, yep. Um, so that makes it sound like all I do is watch TV, which is not the case. I'm working on some really cool projects that, that you know might be happening soon, so that's fun. Oh, that's good. It's keeping me creative mm-hmm. and on my toes. But in terms of you know getting out and about, you know, I'm, I live in the city now, which yeah. I've been wanting to do for like two decades. But you know, COVID is still a thing, and I'm right. I have asthma, so mm. I'm I'm a little uh, wary yeah. of jumping back in. But in the not too distant future, my goal is to like see a, a different Broadway show every night and go out to a different restaurant every night until yeah. I run out of them, <laughs> because it's been a very long couple of years. When did you move? You, so you live in Manhattan now? Yep. Um, I moved like four months ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. I lived in the wilds of <laughs> Long Island for wow. over 20 years. But now that my daughter's in college. Do you like living in Manhattan outside of the COVID situation? Oh, I am a city kid. I grew up yeah. in Queens. I lived in Manhattan for a long time. And before I made the horrific st- mistake <laughs> moving to Long Island. <laughs> so it's good. It feels like I'm home again. <laughs> Um, Okay, so switching all the way to a different direction here, somebody wants to know, what do you think is the single most dangerous thing about your uncle? Uh, There's nothing he won't do to protect himself. Nothing. Yeah. There's no bottom. There is no... We can't underestimate that. And uh, it's funny, I I was on Mehdi Hassan show on peacock just had its first anniversary and i had totally forgotten this but i had been on his very first show a year ago yeah so he asked me and norm ornstein who'd been his other first guest to be on uh and he played a clip and it was from october 5th 2020 and it was my saying exactly that he has no bottom (laughs) there's nothing he won't do he'll take (laughs) us all down with him um so that is it there there are no boundaries there's no nothing in him that will stop his his selfishness yeah so uh i mean what else do we need to know yeah he he is directly responsible for murdering over mm-hmm. seven hundred thousand people mm-hmm. because he thought it was a good campaign strategy mm-hmm. yeah he's he's quite disgusting he is uh, yes, oh my that's god that's one way of putting it <laughs> <laughs> yeah mass murderers have a tendency to be pretty disgusting yeah they do Um, Somebody else also says, how serious do you think Donald's health problems are, specifically his asthma, and I don't know that he has asthma, and related lung issues? I I don't know about anything like that, so that's what they asked. Um, I don't either. I'm almost certain he he didn't have asthma when I knew, for sure. Um, Maybe there's some COVID-related issues. Right, yeah. Because obviously he had some serious respiratory um, issues while he had covid but you know, I don't, I don't pay any attention to him. Like I don't seek out video <laughs> or anything. So I don't know. I, it's hard for me to believe that he isn't suffering from some kind of health issues simply because he, he's so incredibly unhealthy. 
Uh, plus, of course, the untreated psychiatric disorders. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. Uh, obviously, he still is able to get out there and hold his hate rallies on occasion. Yeah. Um, and he's still capable of um, stringing uh, the GOP along mm-hmm. uh, and remaining shockingly the head of the party. Um, but I think it's impossible because they're not going to ever tell the truth about that. I no. heard that. I mean, I hate, hate even talking about this person, Stephanie Grisham. Right. So do not buy her book, please. <laughs> um, but I think it was, I think she was the one saying that Donald needs to come clean about his health issues. Right. Yes. No, I thought, will, I thought it was Omarosa. I thought it was Omarosa. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So forget I mentioned that another person. But you still um, don't have to buy her book. Don't, don't buy Omarosa's book either. Right. If she has one. Um, yeah. So, so that is. <laughs> Presumably, that means there are some. I, I'd yeah. be shocked if there weren't. They'll never complain about. I mean, people in that position never do anyway. No. Like Democrats, but you know, right. we, it's just all conjecture at this point. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens because I guess with Amarosa, you know, she the judge ruled in her favor regarding her mm-hmm. NDA, and so yep. now that opens this up. I mean, it was funny because the last time you were on my show, I mentioned Noel Kasler was on the show, and he worked for uh, on Apprentice. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, that was like a juicy, juicy ass podcast because he was talking mm-hmm. about when Donald would get angry, he would start screaming and then that he would shit his pants and that he would have to be escorted off. Like somebody would help him and take him and wash him up. And, you know, I mean, that there were a lot of people said, is that really true? Did that really happen? Um, you know, maybe it. I don't know. Maybe more people, if they get out of their NDA, would corroborate this information and while it is just gross and disgusting and it really doesn't matter i think it would uh i don't think it would be that surprising that something no, like that were to the happen the thing about that and i don't know I, I mean i wasn't there i don't know i mean why lie about it but the the only thing that that gives me pause is then who would want to who would admire him who would want to be anywhere near him that's what i find i totally agree with you but i right? feel like at the same time just his his vulgar personality you could say the same thing about his vulgar personality i don't know Good why point. i don't know why whatever that guy's name is and i can never remember who who, who started uh apprentice oh mark burnett mark who burnett. should be in a very deep dark hole yes yeah. so it's like why did he choose donald why well, donald yeah it, it, listen because he is he's of use and yes. that's why the Republican Party stuck with him. That's it. And this is what I need to remind myself of always. It's not that people see in him something we're missing. Right. It's that they admire in him the things we absolutely hate. Yeah. And that, that's that's how it makes it. They love that he's disgusting. They love that he lies right. constantly and gets away with it. They love that he is a weak, pathetic person who still somehow – Yeah succeeded and got all of the power well they and, love yeah power. and and like you were saying earlier as far as racism in this country and that journalist you talked to that he was 150 years in the making and so mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think i think <clears throat> that's it and i mean oh god who was it i wish i could remember now and i don't remember but it was it was maybe it was um breitbart somebody in breitbart did an article that um okay let me get this right that democrats are getting vaccinated so because they know that because they are republicans won't and that basically you know republicans are dying and i guess that's somehow democrats fault or something like that and so it, on the lips yeah <laughs> so it's like oh my god that logic is just it's so pretzel mm-hmm. that it makes my brain hurt trying to even think or, or describe it but yeah. um but yeah i think i mean he, and it's it's like seriously if donald shits his pants that's literally the least of our worries <laughs> <laughs> and the least offensive thing about him this is true yes. this is true <laughs> but i think it's 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 so um representative of how this country unfortunately this racist country puts up you know white men who could shit their pants and we're still like, oh, my God, we love this guy. Even, you know, I mean, I don't know. Like, my aunt is a full-blown MAGA. In fact, it was interesting. Her birthday mm-hmm. is today. And I spoke with her yesterday, and I could not tell her that I was interviewing you because clearly that would have offended her. And, right. and I couldn't bring it up. But I did bring up, um, you know, you have to tiptoe around certain subjects. And so I was mentioning that, you know, uh, uh, real long story short, 
Bob, Bob's mother is, her birthday is today too. And so um, sh- he had said that uh, this weekend that uh, he mistook, th- it was, it's the following weekend, but he thought it would be this weekend that she wanted to see him up in Pennsylvania with his brother. And so um, I have something to do this weekend, so I couldn't go, but I know it was supposed to rain. And then I got all this anxiety because I, I, I suffer with anxiety from occasion, and COVID makes it worse because, mm-hmm. you know, you're hiding out in your home. <laughs> and it makes everything worse, but <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Especially anxiety. <laughs> and so it's like yesterday morning when Bob said that to me, th- or Monday morning, I, I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I started to worry, and I started to feel completely anxious. It's just what I do if he has a long ride and I'm not going to be on it, or if I do, or something like that. And so... You know, and I'm talking to my aunt, and I said to her, I said, you know, and just being, you know, having deal- having to deal with COVID and being locked away and everything has made it that much more difficult for me to get out on the road or to imagine, you know, Bob out on the road alone. And it was like, she just said nothing. And it, it was like, I can't even talk to her. This was not about the COVID vaccine. It was not a political thing. <sighs> it was just that COVID is making me a little bit more anxious. And but her- for them, it is a political thing. That's what that's one of the the worst things Donald did Mm -hmm. of the many, many worst things he did was to make COVID divisive when it should have united us. Right. At a time when we really needed to be united. It is political for these people. Yeah. And it's like she you know, I mean, I could tell the reason she was so quiet. It was because she was pissed. And, you know, it's like, oh, my God. And, you know, and it's like I just, of course, you know, I usually tell her I had Billy Baldwin on not too long ago so I could bring him up, even though because she doesn't she doesn't know his politics. And I don't even think she's that familiar with who he is anyway. But it was Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I got an actor on my show and I can talk to her about that. Exactly. And, um, you know, but it's like I knew it's like if I if I would have said that you were on my show, I think her head would have popped off. She would have been so like, ah! <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, I'm so sorry <laughs> I have that effect on people. <laughs> well, clearly, you know, we my mother is very liberal and and I am, and she is not. So it just it makes things very difficult, as so many families in this country experience every single day. It's just very tough. Um, well, good for you for trying to negotiate it. I mean, I just like, don't have that problem. Um, well, well, that's the, I don't know that I could, you know, if and, it were an option. Well, that's the thing. You know, I mean, there are some other people in my family and in Bob's family that we just have to deal with for one reason or another. And with her, you know, this is the really sad part. She has always been a good aunt to me and when I was a little girl I spent a lot of time at her house she would you know make me pancakes in the shape of whatever I wanted we would take walks Mm. together Um, it was just a very sweet and loving relationship and throughout my entire life she's always been there she's you know generous with me she gives me money for me she's the only aunt that gives me aunt or uncle that gives me money for my birthday or whatever and it's you know I mean I don't I don't talk to her because she gives me money it's right. not that much money, but it's it's the idea that she keeps it up. And it's like, I'm not going to turn my back on her if she's still willing to, you know, be there for me and love me. And she does. And that's what makes it so tough because it's like yeah. we love each other, but we don't really like each other. And especially yeah. with my mom, because they're sisters and it's like, you know, how siblings can be. There's usually some kind of competition. She doesn't have any competition with me. Uh, she She feels it, I think, more with my mom. But that's, mm-hmm. just, you know, my mom's older, and I think there was always a little bit of that sibling thing going on with them, and they know which buttons to push and all of that. Mm-hmm. But, it, yeah, I mean, it just it makes it so difficult because there are people in both of our families who are uh, Trump supporters, or if they're not full-blown Trump supporters, they're still, okay, maybe Ted oh, Cruz. so Ted sweet Cruz. that they support me. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. You know what I mean. I know. Yeah, I do know I'm trying to so, – oh, wait, here, let me, find, <laughs> let me find the comment. I'm going to let you go in a minute, but – <laughs> Let me find the comment because somebody. <laughs> I do try. I tried with this. I I, I say Trump on Twitter because I know you were watching me for listen, a while. I I, it, I couldn't make Donald stick. I tried, but you know I I I concede <laughs> that when people say Trump nine billion times out of nine billion times, they mean Donald. I so, know, and it must be really <laughs> tough for you. But here, somebody just said, you can tell her from me if you wish. That I love the subtle contempt she expresses every time she <laughs> refers to her uncle by his first name. But I'll leave that up to you. So I just told you. <laughs> you know what's really funny about that, though? Huh. It isn't subtle contempt 
or any kind of contempt. It's just what I always called him. Right. <laughs> in my family, like we had my Aunt Marianne was Aunt Marianne. Mm -hmm. My dad was Uncle Freddie. And the rest of them, we only called, it was Elizabeth, Robert, and Donald. Interesting. So, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of contempt to go around. <laughs> right. But I'm just calling him by the name I've called him my entire life. Yeah. So it's also like, what am I supposed to call him? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Trump. <laughs> you know? So anyway, I'm glad people take it that way, though, because it makes it even better. It does. It does. Um, okay, the last thing I'm going to ask you, and I, I'm just throwing this on you, so you have to be quick on your toes, but I trust that you will be. <laughs> um, what do we have to be hopeful about? We have a lot to be hopeful about, uh, the, but I'll leave it with one, probably the key thing, is there are so many more of us than there are of them. Mm -hmm. We need to hang on to yes. that in our yes, darkest yes, moments, yes. <laughs> and we need to remember that if we unite and if we um, stick together and, and take the threat as seriously as we need to, we'll, we'll overcome the the structural disadvantages. Right. Uh, so that's a big thing. Well, first of all, thank you for being on the show again. Um, My pleasure. Thank you for writing your book. Uh, it, it's it was a fantastic. That wasn't book. so pleasurable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I can imagine. But I just want to say. I mean, I, I in the last couple of days I read it, and it was really really good, and I highly recommend it. And it's on Amazon, and I recommend that it's it's what's the full title? It's the Reckoning. Uh, our nation's trauma and finding a way to heal. Thank you. I, I, again, you should buy it. And then after you read it, give her a good review because authors need reviews on Amazon. So please give her a good review. And before I let you go, tell everybody where they can find you. Um, I'm really only on Twitter these days. It's okay. at Marielle Trump. All right. um, I hope I might be going over to Instagram at some point. I'll let people know <laughs> on Twitter. But Twitter is my uh, is my thing yes with you. and i think most people are already following you because <laughs> you've got like a million <laughs> followers <laughs> well I, I i have a lot of fun on twitter so yes twitter uh, twitter can be fun and it can also be a hellscape be. <laughs> um <laughs> of course you can find me at author kimberly k-i-m-b-e-r-l-e-y on twitter and all my books on amazon etc etc thank you so much mary it's so cool you are so cool everybody loves you and i just want to make sure you know that you are awesome and thank you <laughs> well, okay, I'm like overwhelmed now. But seriously, I, I have such a blast talking to you. Um, and I, I just, I appreciate it. Well, we all love you. We all have your back. And um, you take care. All right, you too. Bye -bye. Thanks. Thanks.